Okay. Today, we're probably not going to finish the lesson I was going to have planned because apparently there's been a lot of trickiness with understanding this topic with my earlier classes. I'm trying to get down to the bottom of why it's, it's so hard to understand, but every class is different, every person is different. We'll see how it goes. Today, and probably a little bit on Tuesday, we are going to cover taxonomy, phylogeny, and if we're lucky, cladistics. Okay, I am going to be going back and forth between these written notes and the PowerPoint. You guys can do a little activity with something I have here. See if you can do it. But let's deal with taxonomy first. And this is taxonomy, not taxidermy. Taxidermy is that stuffed squirrel that your grandpa has in his closet. This is taxonomy, which is the science of classifying, naming, and organizing life. The father of taxonomy is Carl, or Carolus, we'll call him Carl Linnaeus. This is just like Darwinist evolution, Mandel is to genetics. This, uh, this gentleman is to taxonomy. And I believe he started this in the 1700s. And generally, uh, according to Linnaeus's ideas, there were two kingdoms. At this time, kingdoms was the highest level of organization when it came to classifying life. And according to Linnaeus's model of taxonomy, you are either one of two types of organisms. You are either a plant or you're an animal. Now to distinguish a plant from an animal, it was either considered that a plant is immobile and an animal was mobile. That's how he, uh, he made those distinctions. Well, you got to get a little more specific from there. So when it came to plants, there were one of three types. You were either a grass, you were a shrub, or you were a tree. When it came to animals, you either had red blood or non-red blood. This is the way it was for quite a while. Plant or animal, plant or animal. Remember, no one knew about bacteria. No one knew about viruses and all other stuff. But we're going to get there. Now, not too long after that, there was a third kingdom that was realized. And this kingdom was actually confused as being part of the plants. This kingdom represents organisms that mostly grow from the ground, but... With the invention of the microscope, they looked at their cells, and their cells had no chloroplasts, which means they did not do photosynthesis. So what type of organism is out there that could have been confused for a plant is heterotrophic by deco decomposing. We are heterotrophic by consuming things. Plants are autotrophic by photosynthesis. What type of heterotroph gets nutrition from decomposing matter, organic matter, Ryan? Fungi is correct. This was the third kingdom. What's that male kingdom in the plant? Shrub. There's a fourth kingdom that was later realized, and this kingdom is actually the predecessor of the previous three. In other words, the previous three evolved from this one. This is a kingdom that we very rarely talk about in this class. They are unicellular eukaryotes. Do any of you know what they are? Protists is correct. 
Who said that? Good. Protista, Latin. These are single-celled or unicellular uh, eukaryotes. And this is where fungi, animals, and plants actually came from. So now we're up to four kingdoms, guys. Then we have a fifth kingdom. And this is the fifth and final kingdom all the way up to about the early 90s, where the whole thing got a facelift, the whole taxonomic um, system. Uh, this kingdom is called the Monarans or Monera. These are all prokaryotes. Every prokaryote, diseases, uh, the good guys, most, most prokaryotes are actually good. Some are neutral as far as we're concerned. Uh, some are parasitic or infectious. Avery McKenzie, uh, Reagan, make sure you get these on your way out. I'll try to get into you later. So everybody, we had the five kingdom system for a few, uh, it really got revised to the five uh, kingdom system on era, it came around in the 50s or 60s. And this lasts all the way up to about the early 90s. So um, your parents maybe, great, or your grandparents, that if they were in school, they learned about these five, plant, animal, Fungi, protist, monera. Well, there is a problem. And that problem was realized with the invention of DNA technology, being able to study DNA, compare DNA of different species. And scientists realized that the kingdom monera has members that are far too diverse to be put in the same uh, category. That would be like having hot dogs and ice cream in the same aisle at Publix. You just don't see that. They're too diverse. They belong somewhere else. And so this resulted in the whole taxonomic field of biology to go get a huge facelift. And this resulted in the three domain system. And we still use this one today. Scientists decided that they're gonna make a level that's even higher than kingdom. At the time, kingdom was the highest level of taxonomy, but they made one even higher. And the three domains are as follows. Bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. What happened was, is the kingdom Monera basically got broken up into these two. And, and kingdom is still below domain. It goes domain, then kingdom. But bacteria represent common prokaryotes. When you wake up in the morning, you have bad breath, that, that's, back, that's the domain bacteria. Um, when you're out at the lunch table and there's bacteria underneath your shoe, that's likely the domain bacteria. Archaeans are called extremophiles or extremophilic prokaryotes. Now you've heard that suffix before, philic, like hydrophilic, extremophilic. What does it mean to be philic or philia? Loving, liking, wanting. These prokaryotes love extreme environments, super hot, uh, super acidic, super gassy like methane, super salty, very, very extreme conditions. And then this one should be self-explanatory. The eukarya are all the eukaryotes. And this is going to include plant, animal, fungus, and protist. That's the one we belong to. So the other four kingdoms, kingdom plantae, kingdom animalia, kingdom fungi, kingdom protista, they belong to the uh, domain eukarya. And this is what we use today. Now, if you're curious where do viruses fit in all this, viruses technically are not alive. To be considered living, you must be made up of at least one cell and you must be able to reproduce on your own. Now, Shane or Reagan or Riley, you can't reproduce on your own, but you can generate your own cells. You can't make life on your own. Well, 
viruses, A, they're not even made of cells, and B, they can't even make more viruses without a host. That's why we don't consider them alive. They're called obligate parasites. And when we say the virus is dead, we say it's not viable. How can you be dead if you're not alive? So it's not viable. COVID is uh, viable on a piece of paper for, I don't know, three hours or so. Some viruses can last days, some can last hours. All right, well, when it comes to taxonomy, there are eight taxons. Taxons are levels. And before I get to those taxons, I wanna give you an idea of how this is all set up. Remember, this is all about organization. So Reagan, do you like cookies? Yeah. Sure, who doesn't? Well, what type of cookies do you like in particular? Okay, um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to narrow it down to where you can find these Thin Mints. And I'm gonna first say, we have to obviously go somewhere. I don't think you can just spontaneously create them. So there's a lot of places in this world, Reagan, there's volcanoes, there's football stadiums, there's schools, there's stores, there's parks, there's the ocean. Where are you gonna go to get cookies? A store. A store, okay, so we're gonna start there. Now, Reagan, there's lots of different stores. There's clothing stores, auto parts stores, uh, construction and houseware stores, food and medicine, so on and so on and so on. What kind of store are you going to go to? All right, call that a grocery store. Let's continue to get more specific, shall we? There's many types of grocery stores just in Florida alone. You have uh, when dixie you have Publix, you have Whole Foods, you have Sprouts. If you go up north, you have Kroger. Obviously, you have Target and Walmart all over the place. Which one are you going to go to? Let's go to Publix. Okay, Publix is filled up with many different types of foods, many different sections. There's the booze section, there's the dairy, there's the meats, there's the seafood. They have all the various aisles. You have the produce section, bakery section, deli section. Where are you going to go to find the, uh, the cookies? Okay. Now the bakery has bread, has donuts, has cakes, has muffins, has loaves, uh, has a lot of sweet treats. What are you going to be looking for exactly in the bakery? What section? Okay. Cookie section is it. And in the cookie section, you have the black and white cookies, you have the sugar cookies, you have sprinkle cookies, you have chocolate chip cookies. What kind of cookie are you may be looking for? And that's going to be those Thin Mints. Can you get more specific than the Thin Mint level here? And it's okay to say no. What's more specific? You're looking for Thin Mints. What would be more specific than Thin Mints? I think we're good. I think we're good. All right. You, I guess you could do gluten free or. I don't think they make them. Yeah. All right. So. My point is, guys, is that the whole purpose of taxonomy is not just is not exclusive for biology. We do it in every aspect of life. You go to Home Depot, you're trying to find a plunger, you're going to look in the right section. You're not going to go to Hollister to get a plunger. Um, everything is organized, or at least we try to make it as organized as possible. And biology is no different. We know of millions and millions of life forms that are just alive now. What about all the ones that lived in the past? Everything that's ever lived, whether it be plant, animal, fungus, protist, uh, archaea, or bacteria, we have learned to categorize. And these are all with the eight taxonomic levels. These are called the eight taxons. And we're going to go over them from the least specific to the most specific. So number one is domain. There is nothing higher than the domain level. Maybe this might change in, a, uh, in the future. We'll have to wait and see. After domain, you have kingdom. This used to be the highest level up until about 1990. And that's when the whole, process, uh, the whole methodology got a facelift. Number three is phylum. The plural for phylum is phyla. Number four is class. Number five is order. Number six is family. Number seven is genus. 
Anybody know what the plural of genus is? Think of what different types of movie themes are or music. Genre. And number eight is species. The word specific is what species means. That's why it's species, specific. And so I think it's only appropriate that you guys actually know your own species. You all know that you're homo sapien. Well, that's just these two levels here. Homo sapien. What about the other six? So I'm going to teach those to you because, come on, you're a human. You need to know yourself. So what domain do you think we belong to? Archaea, bacteria, or eukarya? We're eukarya. And of the eukaryotes, there are four kingdoms, animalia, plant, fungi, protist. Which one are we? We are animalia. And when you're an animal, you really have to narrow down to if you are a vertebrate or an invertebrate. Are we a vertebrate or an invertebrate? We're vertebrates. And the, the phylum for vertebrates is called chordata. You kind of hear the word cord in there, like spinal cord. It's actually referring to the notochord. The notochord is the precursor to the spinal cord. And then class. Well, there's about five main types of vertebrates. There's fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, mammals. Which one are we? We are mammalia. And then you gotta get more specific. What type of mammal are we? Well, there's rodents, there's cetaceans, which are whales, there's carnivores, you know, bears, wolves, lions, badgers, all those things. We are primates. Primates includes uh, tarsiers, lemurs, monkeys, both new world monkeys, old world monkeys, and apes. We're a human-like primate, so we are hominidae. Do you know how many different types of uh, homo species there have been? About nine. We're the last, we're the last one standing. So this is your entire classification. Eukarya, animalia, chordata, mammalia, primates, hominidae, homo sapien. Something you'll notice is that with the family, everything ends in day. Hominidae, crocodilidae, uh, felidae, cat, Canidae, dog, canine. Uh, a rattlesnake's family is a viperidae, viper. I don't know what it is, just family all ends in D-A-E. Well, I want to focus on the last two. This is part of the binomial system. This is the scientific name. We call this, um, this whole system of naming things scientifically is called binomial nomenclature. How many is by? By is two. Nomial means name. So two name and nomenclature is like naming system. Two name naming system. And species can be named after characteristics of the organism. It can be named after the person who discovered it. There's a species of spider that somebody named after Angelina Jolie. Uh, they can be named after mythical creatures. They can be named after geographic locations, like the alligator's scientific name is alligator mississippiensis. So homo sapien actually means wise human or wise man or knowledgeable man, something like that. <clears throat> This is also your specific epithet. Your specific epithet is your two-part scientific name. And you have to write it a very specific way. I'm gonna show you how to actually do that. When you're writing the specific epithet, you first have to write everything in italics. That's a must. If you're in college and you have to write a report, if, if it was this class and I was having you do a report, you would have to uh, highlight it and put it in italics. So the first word is homo, it's capital H, lowercase m-o-o-m-o-o. -M -O -O -M -O. Has to be uh, italicized and only the H is capital. And then the second word sapien is all lowercase. If you were actually putting this on a report, you would have to make it italicized. You should make it bold and it should be underlined. The other way to write it is just to write the first initial, H, followed by sapien, underline. All right. Well, 
this is all in the language of Latin. I mean, know why we chose Latin for every single scientific name of every single creature on earth? Why not French? Why not English? Mackenzie? Yes and no. It is the, the root of many languages, but not all of them. What about Japanese? Then how do people all over the world know it? It is scientifically accepted. Um, the main reason why it's Latin is Latin doesn't change. It's a dead language. It doesn't change anymore. Every year we are adding new words to the English language. Lit used to just be the past tense of, uh, you know, light. I'm going to light the grill. 10 minutes later, did you light the grill? Yes, the grill is lit. Now we say, oh man, did you see that? You see a crash, I'm so lit. Woke just was the past tense of wake. I woke up. Now woke is something totally different. Google was a noun. I am going to go to google.com. Now it's a verb, Google it. I don't know the answer is Mr. Thorson, Google it. Uh, so we're always changing and adding words to our language, but that would be really uh, frustrating if you could do that with scientific names. So we need to have something that's steadfast and constant. And that's why we do Latin because it doesn't change. <clears throat> also, if you look around the world, and if you're online, I'll get you all hooked up here. If you go around the world, there are multiple common names for the same creature. For instance, here's a great white shark. It has the common names, great white shark, white pointer, white shark, white death. But it only has one scientific name, Carcharodon carcarius. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of Megalodon, the big 50 foot long great, witch, great white shark that lived about 50 million years ago. That was after the dinosaurs, by the way. Uh, its scientific name is Carcharodon megalodon. Um, look at this shark. This is what, if you've ever been to Florida Aquarium, looks really scary. It's really not that mean. It has five common names, but it only has one scientific name worldwide, Carcarius taurus. So let's say someone from Australia comes to Tampa and in Australia, they call it a gray nurse shark. They come to the Florida aquarium, they see this in the aquarium, they go, that's not a gray nurse shark, that's a ragged tooth shark or vice versa. Well, it's the same thing. There's just multiple names, but that can be confusing. So you wanna go by the one scientific name. Whether you're in Australia or Tampa, it's called Carcarius taurus. All right. Okay. Next, we are going to do phylogeny. Oh, yeah, we're good. I thought I left something out, but I did not. Phylogeny is the second part of today's lesson, and this is a depiction of evolutionary history, which means you have to use the evidence for evolution. Let's see, uh, you know, lightning round. Can this class identify the five evidences that we did the other day for evolution? Any five, any or all five, any order. Raise your hand if you know one. Comes to mind. Jet. Fossil record. The fossil record. Number two, Hannah. Comparative anatomy, also called homology. Number three, comparative embryology. Number four, biogeography. Number five, number five, the most, the newest and probably the most irrefutable. Annie? We call it molecular homology, DNA. So you have to use those five evidences to classify life with how I'm going to show you. And when we do phylogeny, Phylogeny is all about classifying life based on a, like a depiction. We use a tool called a phylogenetic tree. Now, you guys are my fourth AP class of the day. My first three have had a little trouble with this, and I'm trying to get to the bottom of why this is being so challenging, so I'm going to do my best to try to explain this better. When you're making a phylogenetic tree, you typically begin with the uh, common ancestor of all life, whoa, that happened. of all life on the tree. So, um, think of, let me think of some critters here. Uh, 
Okay. This is a phylogenetic tree. Here I'm gonna have a coyote, a wolf, a cheetah, a lion, and a tiger. And I'm about to get into what's been given in my previous classes trouble. I had a young lady say this was on her mastery and she didn't get it. So I wanna make sure we clear this up because it, it, you will be held accountable for it. Guys, whenever there is a divergence, or a divergence is a split in the tree, that is going to equal a common ancestor. One, th I, I may be wrong on this, but there's a difference between number of branches and number of splits. I think that might be something where there's some confusion. I'm not saying the number of branches is a common ancestor. Each I'm saying where the branch split. If I have two branches, how many splits are there? Right. So I have four fingers here. How many splits are there? Yeah, exactly. So how many total common ancestors can you identify on this phylogenetic tree? In other words, how many splits do you see? One, two, three, four. There are four. Which one is the original common ancestor of the coyote, the wolf, the cheetah, the lion, or the tiger? What color? The green one. That's correct. Okay, so do the coyote and the tiger have a common ancestor? Yes. As you look at the bottom of the phylogenetic tree, it gets older and older and older. So let me ask you this. What has a more recent common ancestor, tiger and cheetah or tiger and wolf? Tiger and cheetah, because the, the divergence between, or the split between the cheetah and the tiger is further up on the tree. So this would say that the tiger and the cheetah are more related than the tiger and the wolf. What about the tiger and the cheetah versus the tiger and the lion? Who's more closely related? Tiger and lion, because their divergence is even more recent than the cheetah. The tiger and the lion share a more recent common ancestor than they do with the cheetah. And the cheetah has a more recent common ancestor with those two other big cats than they do with the wolf or the coyote. But if you go back in time far enough, and that you'll hear that a lot. If you go back in time far enough, you'll find the common ancestor. If you go back in time to the dawn of life, you'll find the first common ancestor of everything that's ever lived. So I'm gonna switch over to your PowerPoint and I'm going to put up a phylogenetic tree that's about halfway done. Let's see if I can zoom in on this thing. Hold on, make sure everybody at home can see this. Okay. There we go. I want to focus on these five animals. Now, listen carefully. I'm going to tell you their common names. On the top, we have a leopard. This is a badger. This is an otter. This is a coyote. This is a wolf. Reagan, what is this? A badger. Uh -huh. uh, Mackenzie, what's this? An otter. Okay. What is this one? Okay. Coyote, what's this one? That's a wolf, what's that? Uh, jet? Cheetah. Leopard. Oh, leopard. Spots, man. <laughs> leopard. <laughs> All right. You know how I know it's a leopard, not a cheetah? Because a cheetah is not panthera. Cheetah is actually not considered a big cat. It's one level lower. So um, this Phylogenetic trees shows order, family, genus, species. I know it's hard to see, but trust me, that species. They all are carnivora. 
So if they're all carnivore, carnivore is going to be the order. Do they have the same domain, kingdom, uh, phylum, and class? Yes, they do. So the illustrator of this diagram is figured, why bother writing domain, kingdom, phylum, and class if they're all the same? We're going to start here, carnivora, which is the same too. Carnivora is going to be all of these. But then we have a split. There's the common ancestor of all five. Let's look at the leopard. The leopard goes its own route. We call this a lineage. It's going to be family Felidae, which means cats. Genus Panthera, which means big cats. Ironically enough, an actual panther is not called Panthera. And then we have the species, which is Pardus. Panthera Pardus, known as this italicized. Down here, we go this way. And this right here is a common ancestor of what animals? Riley? Which four? The, what I'm pointing to is a common ancestor of the badger, otter, coyote, and mole. Good. Let's go up here. Both the badger and the otter are the family Mustelidae. I don't even know what that means. Something like a weasel, I think. Or, yeah, a weasel. Um, and then they diverge again. They do not have the same genus. The badger is the genus Taxidia. Uh, the otter is the, the genus uh, Lutra. And then we have the species Taxus and the species Lutra. So this is Taxidia Taxus and then Lutra Lutra. And then we go down to the last part, the coyote and the wolf. Do they have the same family? Yeah, candidate means dog or wolf. Then we have Canis. Same genus or genre. The only thing that's different between them is the species. Latrons for the coyote and lupus for the wolf. Which two animals on this phylogenetic tree are the most closely related, Avery? Uh, Do they have the same order? What is it? Carnivora. Do they have the same family? What is it? Do they have the same genus? I'm just talking about it so the microphone can hear. Do they have the same genus? Do they have the same species? Okay, so Avery says they have the same family, um, or excuse me, they have the same order, family, and genre. That's correct. Let's go to uh, Andrew. What two species are the next closely, closest related after the coyote and the wolf? Do they have the same order? Yes. Do they have the same genre? Yes. Do they have the same, uh, or no, wait, do they have the same family? I misspoke. The same family? Do they have the same genre? No. No, they don't. Okay, very good. Here's the question that's been really busting some brains here. Duncan, how many total um, common ancestors are there on this phylogenetic tree? No one. A common ancestor is represented by a split, not the number of splits, just a split. So let me rephrase that. Not the number of branches that come from the split, just the number of splits. How many total splits do you see in this phylogenetic tree? This is what has been getting a lot of people. I'm trying to understand why. Huh? It is four. One, two, three, four. This is the common ancestor of the wolf and the coyote. This is the common ancestor of the badger and the otter. This is the common ancestor of the badger otter ancestor and the wolf coyote ancestor. And this is the common ancestor of all five. There are four common ancestors here. This is the most distant. This is the most recent. Okay? I'm trying to understand why that's being a lot of trouble and so I can help correct that. All right, so not only do we have this with um, current organisms, but we also have this with extinct. I remember seeing something like this at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. If you ever go there, you'll see something very similar to this. This is a phylogenetic tree with dinosaurs. To make sure, to, for you guys to prove to me you can read this properly, I want you to count on how many total common ancestors you see on this phylogenetic tree for dinosaurs. I'll give you a minute to count them up. Keep it to yourself, keep it in your head.
Catherine, how many you got? Sixteen. You are correct. Ready? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. If you look at the very top, there's birds. Here's another question. Which type of dinosaur is more closely related to a bird? A Tyrannosaurus or a Triceratops? Yeah, tri uh, Tyrannosaurus is on the same branch. Or a closer branch to birds than a Triceratops is. Good. Okay. Now, as I said, we have to use the five evidences for evolution to put this together properly. And there are revisions that are made here and there. We'll get to cladistics, uh, cladistics momentarily. Um, I want to just go over this for phylogeny. Just what you guys learned, we got fossil record, embryonic development, uh, behavior, that could also be homology, molecular data, and biogeography. Um, we use the fossil record a lot, especially for your extinct animals. What is this fossil? Bonus question, perhaps next week's test. Archaeopteryx. Look at these guys. Modern day ostrich, and this is a descendant, or excuse me, an ancestor. This is called ornithomimus. It literally means bird mimic. Avery, look at that foot. What does that foot remind you of? A bird of some sort. Duncan, what does that look like to you? You're both right. This is a cassowary. It is a very mean bird. It'll kick you till your intestines come out of your guts. It's really mean. It's a descendant of dinosaurs. All birds are. They are not in Florida unless somebody releases them into the wild. Um, I think they're in Asia. Asia or South America? I'm not sure. I thought they were in like Australia. I'll look it up. All right. So let's uh, get to something different now. Um. If you guys go, if you're online, I'll get you hooked up here in, with this in a sec. I'm going to pass something out to you guys, so I need to cut this up. Here, I'll get it to you. Okay, I'll cut straight lines here. If you have extras, pass them to your uh, Okay, pass those out. We'll fit. We'll figure out who needs more. If you need more, I can give you more. We'll just let's see how many more I need to whip up here. Who needs more? Who needs one? Jet needs one. Risa needs one. If I have extras, that's perfect. Does everybody have one? Good, I'll have more for the rest of the day. Does everybody have one? All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a phylogenetic tree with these six Floridian creatures that I uh, came up with. If you're online, let me get that available for you. Here we are. You can find this on Canvas under an announcement. So I chose the American alligator, the Florida panther, the bald eagle, the fire ant. By the way, there's 201 species of fire ant. You can't just say fire ant. It's like just saying shark. There's a lot more than just shark. Eastern diamondback rattlesnake and the human. I uh, chose the fire ant that's found in Florida, one of the types that's found in Florida. And so what I want us to do here is I want us to make a phylogenetic tree with these creatures. Now keep in mind, it's going to look something like this. I used to have my students do a project with this, so I'm going to stress two things to you guys. One, try to keep things symmetrical. If you have lined paper, like notebook paper, I'd use it so you can have a point of reference with your lines. And try to give yourself some space. Just like any tree, as it gets higher up, it's going to really spread out. So you're going to need all that space. So here's what we're going to do first. 
I need you to look at domain and we're gonna work our way down until we get this whole tree completed. How many different domains do I have here for these creatures? Just one. So we're gonna start here. There's only one domain, guys. Yeah. Domain. Okay, I messed up then. That's that is the typo. That's on my pat. That's eukarya. That's my fault. I'll fix that. Uh, it is eukarya. It's just one. My bad. One domain. It should be eukarya. All right. Now, how many different kingdoms are there? Go to the next level. There's only one. So do we have any splits yet? No. How many phyla do we have? Do we have a split now? How many branches will it split into? We have two different phyla. So we have two different branches. Good. So here comes the split. We're gonna have chordata, which means vertebrate. And we're gonna have arthropoda. Which means um, jointed foot. It's basically an invertebrate with an exoskeleton. Now I want you guys to look at the fire ant. It's the only arthropod. Are there any other arthropods on this list? There are not. So what I'm going to tell you to do is you can go ahead and finish the arthropod. Well, make about three lines in between each one, but try to keep your lines straight and consistent. So the next, one, the next level is going to be a class, which is insecta. The next one's gonna be Hymenoptera. That's gonna be the order. Then we have Formicidae. The genus. Solenopsis, and then the last one is Rick Terry. There's the entire lineage of the fire ants. One down, five to go. Let's go back to the vertebrates. <coughs> the alligator, the panther, the eagle, the snake, and the human. How many different classes are there now? There's, they all have the same phylum. How many different classes? There are three, mammalia, uh, reptilia, and aves, which means birds. So we need to have a three branch split. So far, how many common ancestors do we have? Two, we have two splits. Remember, it's not the number of branches that come from the split, it's just the split. We have two common ancestors so far. Um, are there any other birds besides the eagle? I don't think so. So let's just finish off the eagle. I'm gonna have the middle be aves. I'm gonna have the right be mammalia. And I'm going to have the left be Reptilia. And because there's no other bird, let's just have, let's finish off the eagle like we finished off the uh, ant. All right. The order for the eagle is Asipitriformis. That is a terribly complicated word. Asipitri, I'm going to have to hyphenate it, formis. All right, moving on up. Asipitri day. Uh, 
Haliitis. And then lastly is uh, leukocephalus. Some you guys have had that before. What color is leuco? Yeah, white. And what part of your body is cephal? What color is the bald eagle's head? White head. Okay. I'm gonna let you guys try to do the rest of it on your own. See if you can do that. Sure. I'm gonna do mine. You can peek if you need to, but um, try to do the rest of it on your own. We'll have to do uh, cladistics on Tuesday. Don't forget about your mastering. Don't wait till the last minute. Can we turn into yesterday's assignment? Yeah, should have done that this morning or beginning of class. Hey, real quick, just by looking at this, how many total common ancestors are there here? Four. Four. Which color is the oldest one? Green one. All right. See you Tuesday.